Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you all are doing well this fine morning. I feel like I have to stamp around here enough. I can wake you all up by setting off with gunshots or whatever else is going on over there. Um, as uh, as Senator said, I've been the I've been the managing editor for Cheesy Publications. Uh, I've got my own book, Parasite Fleshside, coming out. Um, and there are copies available, so my brief plug for that is that some of the themes of what I'm going to be talking about today do sort of tie in the, them in a much more fictional, kind of interesting way than this would be more kind of powerpoint -y. Uh There are no animations in my book, for example. Uh, but if you're interested in what I'm saying, then uh, come buy a copy, buy the book, that sounds great. Uh, the other thing that I do is I'm a medieval book historian, so I'm in the final year of my PhD at uh, the Center for Medieval Studies at the U of T. And I was talking to Laura, the, uh, one of the co-organizers, and originally my plan for what this talk was going to be was I was going to uh, sort of ground it deeply in 14th century book culture because I thought many of you would be really, really interested in what was going on in terms of scribal communities in the 14th century. And Laura said, no, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> no, Helen, that's not going to work. Then I said, yeah, well, they're going to be really excited about that. There's going to be Chaucer and, and Edna kind of Formata. And she said, no. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, my talk is a little bit like Canadian literature in that it started off bleak, but then I kind of, you know, sort of uh, came to some optimism at the end as opposed to Roberts, which I suppose in the end turned out to be a little bit more like Japanese fiction than it's Canadian. Sorry. Um, but, uh, so, the book is dead, long live the book. My talk actually really does kind of follow really nicely along with what Robert was talking about. Because I'm really interested in what this process of everything being up for grabs is. And what it means in terms of kind of uh, the material form of the book. Because uh, throughout my background, as you might get the impression, I love books. You know, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm a book sniffer, as Brett Savory often says. You know, I'm one of those people, I like cracking open the books. I like what they feel like. I like the way that they look. And the ebook is a really different kind of beast. So that's what I wanted to talk about. So the title of my talk comes from a Global Mail article on June 18, uh, 2010. It was published by John Barber. And it was sort of part of this, this wave of articles that was coming out in sort of the end of 2010. The Kindle had just been introduced. The, the marketplace was really, really rapidly changing at that time. So there were these huge numbers of articles that were sort of lamenting the death of the book and sort of, you know, a lot of pen reading and hysteria that was going on. So I particularly like this one. And uh, so I'm going to quote from it for a moment. I'm not talking very far away, though, so I'm going to grab it. So in the beginning, says this article, was the word. <laughs> and then came Gutenberg, and that was good. <laughs> and then along came a giddy army of Japanese schoolgirls writing and publishing their novels on cell phones. And lo, the end was nigh, loudly to the literati wail the death of the word. So I think this is really interesting, the sort of idea of what the death of the word is and, uh, and how things were changing at the time. Because a lot of things did really change in 2010. Uh, for example, in the US, Kelly Gallagher pointed out that the ebook market took off in a few short months from October 2010 to January uh, 2011. This was right over the Christmas season as the Kindle was introduced and suddenly everybody got them and everybody started buying up everything they could find. So in that period, the ebook market shot up from 5% of the market to 13%. And then over 2011, for example, in the UK, consumer ebook sales increased by 366%. And so that's pretty huge. That is a pretty radical change. And so maybe there's some reason for this kind of hand wringing about what this change might mean for us. But uh, and here's my here's my reference back to being a medievalist. Um, it made me think of this guy I remember reading about. Uh, his name was Trimethius, and he was a Benedictine monk in the 16th century. 
And uh, this is what he had to say when Gutenberg, who was good, uh, came out with the printing press and all of those new paper books. He said, the printed book is made of paper, and like paper will quickly disappear. But the scribe working with parchment ensures lasting remembrance of himself and for his text. So that's very sweet. We have exactly the same thing with Henry going on back in the 16th century. Um, but this time, you know, it's paper. Because paper isn't the same as parchment. Uh, what parchment is, in its most technical sense, is it's the skin of a sheep or of a goat that's being sort of stretched out on this giant frame and it's being scraped down and then rubbed with chalk and so forth. So I mean, part of the original books, uh, most of them were made out of animal skins, which do last a really long time. I mean, one of the things that I do is I, I spend a lot of time wandering around England and all of these old archives, and I look at all of these parchment books, and, and they're interesting because you can kind of, you can feel how well that they've lasted. But, you know, the paper books lasted as well. Um, we have numerous copies of paper books that have survived from just as long in many cases as the sort of comparative ones made of parchment at the same period. So maybe the handwriting was kind of a thing, because obviously the printing press did change things, but it made a lot of things better. And lo, the end was nigh, and loudly to the letter of the wail of the death of the word. So is this extremist as a viewpoint? I mean, maybe it is. But as Robert was saying, everything really is up for grabs right now. And this, this comes about in a lot of different ways when we think about what are up for grabs. I mean, the marketplace is obviously up for grabs. The ways in which we're publishing things are up for grabs. But what I want to talk about a little bit is the way in which the form of the book right now is also up for grabs. So what does it mean that the word is dead? I mean, surely they're not saying that words are going to be dead. I mean, we're still going to have words, right? Words are still going to exist. I mean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I'm not so interested in words in this case. What we're interested in is the word. And here I think mean that word is literature. Again, oh. And when I'm talking about literature, I'm not actually talking about the distinction between, say, a book that's written about dragons and a book that's written about, I don't know, female angst in 19th century Quebec. Uh, I'm not talking about the distinction between genre fiction and Canada, for example, and I do read lots of Canada, so sorry about that. Uh, I mean, literature as a category of art that has something to do with words and the way that they're placed together. And so the way that I want to try to connect this to our theme of, of beyond the human is uh, by giving Christian's idea of what fake history is. And I was, before I was putting together my presentation, I was watching a bunch of the TED Talks, which are kind of fascinating. And so David Christian was talking about sort of thresholds in the development of the universe. And one of the thresholds he pointed to was the development of humans. Because what he was arguing was that humans have the ability to learn things in real time. But because we have the ability to communicate with one another accurately, we can share information information can be preserved from generation to generation. And this is potentially different from other organisms in the way they interact. And the written word, and books in particular, are a large part of how we do this, how we preserve information and transmit it from generation to generation. And so you might argue that books and the written word are one of the fundamental blocks of civilization. So it's a big deal when things change for the book. I mean, the printing press was a big deal because it did fundamentally change the way in which society worked. So the question is, how are things changing the way that society works now for us? And, and how does that change for what literature is? How does that change for what the, the role of a writer is, particularly somebody who's writing fiction? So my sort of theoretical definition for literature as I talk about it today is uh, literature as a combination of form and language. So form being the, the sort of physical form that it comes into something like a book, language being obviously the way in which words are put together in order to bring about meaning. And so there are, there are all sorts of ways to look at the ebook. And we've, we've seen sort of glimpses of a couple of them in the prior talk. Uh, you know, we can talk about them economically, we can talk about them sociologically, uh, we can talk about them technologically. But what I want to do is take a look at the way in which 
e-books and other electronic forms that we're sort of seeing on the rise as well at the moment might change the way we think about literature as a product of form and language. So let's, let's start off with form. And by form, what I mean here is sort of the range of media that the artwork can take. So here's sort of a, here's sort of a good way out of a couple of different forms that media can take. And what form does for us is form sets up a series of expectations about the way in which the text is going to be presented to the reader. But it also contains certain rules about the way in which you interact with it. So for example, I mean, maybe at a very obvious level, what a book does is a book forces you to read generally in a certain kind of way. So it forces you to read from left to right, from up to down. It forces you to read things sequentially. And though you can manipulate books in different ways, you don't have to obviously reference books. You can go in and you can find the thing you're looking for. But when it comes to fiction, it forces a kind of way of thinking about what literature is and how it works. So for a short story collection, for example, you know, people who are writers or editors, they put stories in particular orders because the book as a whole generates a kind of meaning that is different than if you read the stories out of order. But part of what that is is the way that the book works, because the book forces us to try to read in order, unless we're sort of interacting with it in a different way. And that's different from, for example, the way that Twitter works. Uh, because Twitter sort of is more of a stream of communication, the way in which you engage in it is going to be fundamentally different. The way in which you connect to other people is different, and the way in which you sort of connect to different topics is quite different. Blogs, for example, as well. You know, blogs are some you can go in and you can see the most recent pro, uh, posts, but you can also kind of dive in in all sorts of different ways. You can read chronologically, you can read reverse chronologically. And the meaning changes in each time, but the form itself is kind of open to this. It, it encourages different ways of reading and different ways of interacting with it. Now, a form can also be translated. So obviously, if you have something like a book, you can publish bits of a book on a blog, or you can publish blog articles in a book. So you get movement between forms. They're just sort of fixed things. But sometimes this, uh, this translation process appears seamless. Um, but sometimes it doesn't as well. So for example, if you're moving something like books to television, um, when I was at the Clarion West workshop over the uh, over the summer, uh, I was talking with George Martin about the way in which Game of Thrones was being adapted for television. And one of the interesting points that he was making about it was that when he set up the form of his novel, he was telling it through viewpoint characters. So all of these sort of mass battles and whatnot, they're told through very limited perspectives. And he's got a couple of them in each book that he sort of alternates through. But the thing is, is that if he had an event that didn't happen to one of these characters, even if it was a really, really big event, even if it was a major event, he still couldn't address it directly. He had to tell it through a messenger coming and saying, this thing happened over there, even if it was a large event. And this caused you know, a huge amount of problems for him in the later books when he was trying to figure out how he could tell all the things that he wanted to happen without having the characters that he'd already set up being present at them. But the movie, or the, uh, the television show, for example, that sort of freed him of that. Suddenly, they could show things from a kind of omniscient lens, so they could, they could show events directly. And the point that I'm making there is really that you can transmit something from one form into another, but there are all these changes, there are all these adaptations that end up taking place. Form is restrictive, but it's often restrictive in kind of productive ways. And maybe another example of that would be a Choose Your Own Adventure book, which is kind of a, a way of telling stories that's a little bit ahead of its time in many ways. Because the way that that works is it, it, it sort of denies the form of the book. It wants you to flip around it doesn't read sequentially. But at the same time, you know, I talk to tons of people who, when they get to zero adventures, maybe they'll follow a path or two through, and they'll just read it all in order. You know, they'll read all of those weird sections out of order, because that's what you do with the book. You know, you turn the pages, and you move from page to page, and so it doesn't matter if the narrative doesn't even make sense anymore. Um, but that's a form that, in many ways, is probably better adapted to electronic media, where you can actually just follow a stream kind of seamlessly through without having a physical form that's forcing you to want to do something else with it. So when we come to ebooks, 
here's a case study. Again, this was sort of back from 2010 when there was a lot of people, there were obviously a lot of people really concerned about what was going to happen with the ebooks. And maybe this is a little bit histrionic. Uh, but this was Billy Collins, and he was one of the first people to comment on seeing his own work in the ebook form. And when he did, he was, a, he was a U.S. Poet Laureate, or former U.S. Poet Laureate, he was actually really pissed off because what the e-book did is it broke up the lines of his verse in different ways than he had written it because suddenly you're giving an e-book to a reader who can change the font size. And so if you make the font really, really big, then the line breaks are falling in different places. And for a poet, you know, this can apparently cause huge amounts of upset. <laughs> Because the point that he was making was, he said poetry comes in lines. Poets themselves are line-making creatures. And so in response to this, the Huffington Post concluded that poetry, as the most precise and precious of literary forms, is also, so far, the least adaptable to the growing ebook market. And so a nice kind of counterexample of that is, again, when I was at Clarion, uh, one of my instructors, Kelly Link, asked Ted Chang why he wrote short stories as opposed to some other form of literature. And what Ted Chang replied to this was that ultimately, if you're going to write prose, you need to have a theory of sentences. And I spent some time thinking about what that was, what it meant to have a theory of sentences, because I wanted to be a writer, obviously, and, uh, and I wondered, do I have a theory of sentences? And I think I do. Um, and I realized that at the moment in which it came to copy editing my short story collection, when I started freaking out about where commas were placed, and I realized that I had a really strong sense of the way in which I wanted things to work, because sentences controlled things like rhythm, it controlled the way in which information was being delivered, and if you broke it up in different ways, then it changed the kind of pattern of reading. So, I mean, as a Christie poet, uh, short story writer, so I thought. Um, but what I found was different, is the line isn't a basic unit of communication in the same way. It's a unit of space. It's, it's a visual unit. And the sentence is fundamentally different than the line. The sentence is a grammatical unit. And it's a way of structuring thought as opposed to structuring the visual field. And so inherently, it's what I want to call more reflowable. So here you can see some of the different things that people can do with the formal layout. And again, technology is always changing. So the concerns that Billy Collins had at the time, many of them have been addressed because the programming is allowing people more and more control over the way in which they're going to interact. But because, you know, because you're taking an ebook and you're sending it out to all sorts of different kinds of machines that read code in different ways, um, there's always this potential for a translation gap. But uh, what the ebook sort of works on is the idea of content as being ultimately reflowable, or content as being formless. So the way in which prose works is it is formless. I mean, it has, it's divided into things like, like paragraphs and sentences. But the idea is, is that if you take something like poetry, poetry has a fixed visual form. And the author or the publisher wants a certain amount of control over that. Because if you mess with it, then you're losing meaning. So another example would be something like a graphic novel. If you take a graphic novel, you actually you have to preserve the form identically. You have to preserve the page layout identically, or else you're losing your meaning. And so in some ways, that might be less conducive to certain kinds of e-readers. But prose, on the other hand, it screams out to us as something that is reflowable, uh, something that can be moved into different shapes, and that can be broken up in different ways without inherently changing the way in which we read it, or the way that we understand it. And of course, we, there are counter examples to this. There, there are lots of books that have been published. House of Leaves, for example, is sort of a great horror novel, um, which has embedded footnotes, it has different documents that are sort of being represented in different ways. That's something that inherently isn't reflowable. You need to know what your page looks like in order for the meaning to work, or else you're going to be losing things. And sometimes this happens at really minute levels. I was reading the uh, I was reading the map of time. I'm not sure if any of you guys have read it, uh, but it's this really really fantastic sort of Victorian time travel satire book. But I was I was reading it in a really really early Kindle form, in which none of the formatting had really been preserved. And so there's all these little sort of asides at the beginning because it's set up with this sort of Victorian sense of what titles are and whatnot. But because it wasn't separated out really well, it was actually 
a lot of the jokes, I was missing them. But when I saw it in book form, suddenly I could see it because of the way that things were being laid out. So form does matter potentially at that level. So, so what does this really mean for us? Um, I think what it, one of the changes that we'll see is that when we start thinking about prose, we're going to start thinking about it as more reflowable. I think that for a period, people are going to be less willing to do things that are kind of formally dependent, things that require fixed forms. And you're going to see a sort of a gradual separation between what books are and what ebooks are. And I think we're already starting to see this. Books will become more like art objects where more time is taken over design and, uh, and what you can do with a fixed page. And ebooks are going to kind of move in a slightly different direction. They're going to end up representing works in different ways. But I mean, for authors, as an editor, I know most authors are control freaks. They don't want people messing with their stuff. And what the ebook does right now is it doesn't give us quite as much control as maybe people are used to having. But then again, you know, I read 14th century literature, and Geoffrey Chaucer, the father of English literature, back in the 14th century, he was complaining about exactly the same thing. He wrote this poem that was calling out his scribe, Adam, for messing up his poetry. So maybe the other question is, do authors ever really have control? Or are they always kind of moving after it, sort of seeking at it and yelling at the people who aren't giving it to them? But what form does do is it does change the rules of engagement. So now that it, now that I've talked a little bit about form, I'm going to move a little bit to language. So here my discussion is going to be based less on the ebook and more sort of on the rapid shifts in the technology of communication. Because language, I would argue, follows form. We speak the way we do because we have mouths and we have lips and we have a tongue. So there's a physiological level to the way in which we communicate. And the way in which the written word works, you know, is based on certain physiological characteristics as well. The fact that we have fingers allows us to write. And so our communication is dependent on our physical form. But at the same time, now that we have iPhones and cell phones and keyboards and whatnot, our language is also changing. The, just as the book acts as a kind of prosthetic for memory, these tools are a kind of prosthetic for speech. And the internet is giving us a variety of sort of specialized forms of communication. It's changing the way we think about punctuation, for example, at a fundamental level. And it's giving us a kind of shorthand. And this is all natural. But one example is texting speech. Um, another is the sort of development of the hashtag and the way that it organizes thought on Twitter. Because I, you know, even in my academic work, uh, where we're trying to develop new ways of digitizing manuscripts that weren't available before. Um, you know, we're using hashtags in order to sort of set up categories. So we're seeing sort of modes of thought being determined by, by form to some extent. And these forms of communication are evolving to fit new technologies. They're generally understood by people who use them the most. So people who spend all of their time on Twitter, all of their time on their cell phones, they're ones who can kind of understand this sort of language effortlessly. While people who are sort of moving further behind, it doesn't, it doesn't work quite so well for them. So uh, an example is, uh, I was recently watching Aaron Sorkin's newsroom. And in this show, there's sort of this, uh, there's a classy 20-something office assistant uh, who's, who's working in this journalism office. And she accidentally sends flowers after her funeral with the, with the note, LOL, for which she gets in lots of trouble. Because she thought, for some strange reason, that LOL meant lots of love. So that's probably not, you know, can my condolences, LOL. <laughs> Probably not what you want to find on your, uh, on your flowers. But I thought that this moment was actually really intriguing. Because I thought it didn't read as really authentic to me. Because for me, it seemed like anybody who is of her age, as I am, and uses technology regularly, is in journalism, in which communication is going to be obviously a pretty principal part of what she's doing. She would know what it means, you know? It, it feels like a joke that is written by somebody who is on the other side of that technological gap, potentially writing for an audience that's on the other side of that technological gap, or just not realizing 
that he's maybe just a half beat kind of out of step. And so it doesn't it doesn't read quite right, even though we you know, kind of get we kind of get the point. Uh, so here's another example of the way in which uh, works. Maybe some of you can see I'm sure you've all had issues with this before. So here's a little story for you, it's a nice story. A uh, girl meets boy on plenty of fish and arranges to grab coffee in downtown Toronto. So a girl attempts to text boy with the whereabouts of where they're meeting, lure and duffer it. And what does she get? Blood and suffering. <laughs> So maybe this is not the kind of thing that you want to be pulling out for your first blind date. When the girl tries again, she says, I mean lore, and instead she says, I mean blood. <laughs> she just keeps writing, blood, blood, blood. <laughs> were no doubt alarmed to date. <laughs> and so we all kind of get that. But you know, here's another example. Um, this was reported by the Gainesville Times in which the autocorrect feature on a student's cell phone prompted local authorities to lock down middle and high schools in Hall County um, because a fellow mistakenly sent the wrong, uh, sent a message to the wrong number. And the message that he sent was, gonna be in West Hall today. The autocorrect function on the smartphone changes to, gunman be in West Hall today. Oh. And obviously, it's a, and so they had to shut down the school because that's a pretty serious kind of issue. Um, and these are obviously kind of extremes, and nobody, people aren't really writing literature this way. But what we're seeing is sort of methods of technology in which, because we don't have full control over them at this stage, there's this sort of broader translation gap that's going on. Um, people who use this technology frequently, they're going to be able to read past these gaps and these misunderstandings. Because anybody who uses, you know, an iPhone regularly, who gets a really weird kind of text message, is, you know, maybe they're going to stop and think for a second. Maybe they are trying to say, you know, I want to sleep with your mom. Maybe they're trying to say something else. Um, yeah, it's amazing the number of things that balls get substituted for. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to type in Baca Phoenix, and it kept giving me balls. <laughs> and I thought, what? <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so, so what does this mean for literature? <laughs> Uh, so what does this mean for literature? I mean, it probably means we should learn things about Baca Phoenix probably on our phones. Um, but let's take a look at some of the effects this has had on developments of new kinds of literature that are sort of trying to take advantage of what's going on with these changes. Uh, so this was part of a, uh, a contest that was run by Orange for the best creative use of text messaging. And here's the winner. Um, can any of you guys actually understand what this poem is? Some people back there are nodding. Lots of people. Simon, got it? That's a porch. So here's the translation of what it is. Seasoned with mists and fruitless mellowness and pungent smells of grass over hay, we flop onto ponchos for a minute's rest and try not to plan the rest of the day. So how many people got something that was kind of close to that? Yeah, okay, so most of you got it. So I think what's sort of interesting about this is that so this is a poetry contest in which you're being asked to obviously write sort of using um, write sort of using text messaging speech. But what I found as I was sort of reading through it is it doesn't feel necessarily like an authentic text message. It feels like somebody wrote a poem and then kind of converted it into text messaging. You know, they just took out all of the vowels. And you can even see this to the level that they've substituted in signs to represent their line breaks, because as we know, line breaks are really important to poets. Uh, which I don't say mockingly, because I don't quote, so I don't understand. But, you know, so here what we're seeing is somebody knowing what the form of a poem should be and then trying to replicate it in a technology that ultimately doesn't necessarily try to represent things in the same kind of way. It doesn't want line breaks in text messages. You can put them in if you feel that they're really necessary, but suddenly the kinds of ways in which you're telling the poem, you know, it breaks down a little bit. And for, for an even a closer reading, you get some women's where you actually can't translate necessarily directly. So we flop onto ponchos for a minute's rest. You know, is that flop or is that flip? Is that flap? Is that minute? Is that moment? I mean, it could be a couple of different things, and maybe it doesn't really matter, because maybe you can still just read past that and get the gist. 
But I mean, if you're a poet and you've got like some 30 odd words there, presumably knowing what each of those words is should be important to you. So it's, so it's interesting to see what happens with these kinds of, of gaps in translation. And so here's, a, here's another kind of form. Uh, this, is, this is a Twitter novel, and there have been a number of these that have been published in English. This is from Small Places, which was a Twitter novel published by a uh, news media editor and novelist, N.L. Ballard. And so this sort of comes out of a form that was more popular in Japan, uh, where uh, mobile phone novels were really in vogue. So for example, in early 2010, over 30,000 Japanese Twitter novels existed. A number of which cross over into printed or ebook form and sold, you know, up to 200,000 copies or more. So these were, yes, and you're thinking, we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese market, yeah. Just, but they don't, you know, they don't really end; they just stop at a certain point. <laughs> um, so these were obviously really popular, but they haven't kind of caught on honestly, in the same way here. But what's interesting about it, I mean, what makes this form is that it's potentially effective because the theme is in some way um, dependent on the form. Small Places is about, uh, it's about nature and relationships and compartmentalization and a search for understanding um, of our teeny relationships with the cosmos. So you've got something that in some ways is sort of tying into what Twitter is all about. It's about trying to find ways to connect to people, um, to, to process information, you know, in a much, much wider world than we can ever humanly sort of comprehend. But what's, so, and the way that it's been published here, you know, in these little sort of bite-sized chunks is interesting, because here what it does is it sort of adapts one element of the form of Twitter, which is, you know, the, the character level. But it doesn't sort of adapt all forms of Twitter. It doesn't, for example, make use of hashtags, or it doesn't use the language of Twitter as kind of flawless or effortlessly. <laughs> So it's interesting because it does still work, and it works as a new kind of literature. But again, it hasn't been one that has caught on so much uh, in the English-speaking world. So I'm going to show you uh, one more example. Uh, so this is from a story uh, called Wiki History. I don't know if any of you read this, and it was published by uh, Desmond Borzel. It's a short story in the form of a series of messages posted to a time traveler's forum. And so it's a, basically it's a Wikipedia edit war where old hands have to keep on slapping down the noobs for killing Hitler. <laughs> so I'm going to read you a little bit of it. Okay, International Association of Time Travelers, Members Forum, Sub Forum, Europe, 20th Century, Second World War. 1115-2104. At 1452-28, Freedom Fighter 69 wrote, Reporting my first temporal excursion since joining IATT, have just returned from 1936 Berlin, having taken the place of one of Lenny Reifenstahl's cameramen and assassinated Adolf Hitler during the opening of the Olympic Games. Let a free world rejoice! <laughs> At 1457-44, Silver Wolf 316 wrote, Back from 1936 Berlin, Incapacitated Freedom Fighter 69 before he could pull his um, little stunt. Freedom Fighter 69, as you are a new member, please read IATT Bulletin 1147 regarding the journey of Hitler before your next excursion. Failure to do so may result in your expulsion per bylaw 223. Which the response was at 1806-59, big children, take it easy on the kid, Silver Fox 316. Everybody kills it on their first trip. I did. It always gets fixed within a few minutes. That's so <laughs> the story is really genuinely hilarious, so I do recommend you go find it. I think it's this first published on Escape Pod. You can uh, listen to it on Escape Pod. you can listen to it on Escape Pod. So do go, do go find it because it is very good. But what I found interesting about this for the discussion is that uh, it's something that takes the form and makes it part of the narrative. This isn't something that you could take and you could publish in a different kind of way. Here it's, it's something that's mimicking the ways in which we're interacting with each other more and more and taking a story out of it. And it does so brilliantly because when you read it, you get that instant flash of recognition. It feels authentic and that's what makes it really, really funny. So where does that leave us 
Uh, to me, it seems that the forms I've shown you, successful or not, um, still feel something like a gimmick in some cases. Uh, they don't necessarily feel like a transformation of literature uh, or a transformation of the word. What they do feel like, though, is this beginning of the opening up of possibilities. When a new form emerges, and this I know as a book historian, it first tends to mimic the previous forms which it was based upon so that the translation is kind of easiest. I mean, there's, there's a reason that when you look at your Kindle, it looks like a book. It sort of feels like a book in your hand. It's roughly the same size. And it still divides the text into pages, which you have to kind of manually turn. I mean, there's no need for that in the actual technology of the object. We know that. But it's a starting place because it feels comforting to us. It feels familiar. But I think what's going to happen is we're going to see more and more innovative uses of the things that are special to the ebook. Uh, things that regular books can't do. So choose your own adventures, I think, will probably become more effective. And things that allow you to move through the text in different ways, we might see people doing more and more interesting things with that. So, for example, if we turn to Strange Horizon submission guidelines, here's a little quote from them about this sort of uh, moment of exploration. What they say is, we like the idea of hypertext fiction, but we have not yet published any. If you want to send us a hypertext story, query us to discuss how to submit it. So you know, here people, you're seeing people who are willing to do it, um, but people actually don't know what it means. You know, it's a, it is a brand new world. It's people wanting to look towards these things, but not yet knowing how it's going to work, which is exciting for us because it means we get to be the ones who decide how this stuff works. And so here's Marshall McLuhan. We can tell that he's Marshall McLuhan. <laughs> and I am Gordon Marshall, so I feel like I should also have a cowboy hat here. Uh, but in understanding media, he proposed that a medium, here, he says, a medium, uh, medium affects the society which it plays a role, not only by the content delivered over the medium, but also by the characteristics of the medium itself. And I think that's really interesting, because that's really the point that I'm trying to get at, is that that our content isn't always entirely reflowable. Our content can't always be separated entirely from media, from the form. The form imposes limitations and it imposes rules on what it is that we're doing. Form creates the rules for the content. But why does that matter to us? And it matters because ultimately, genre fiction is special. Because genre fiction is one of the few places where we are called upon to fundamentally recreate and reinvent the rules of writing every time we do it. When a reader goes to a genre fiction book, they know that the rules of the world are going to be fundamentally different than, than the rules of the regular world. And so that opens up a space where I think the reader is going to be more open to being taught not just the, the rules of a kind of a new plot or a new world that's being built up for them, but new ways to read, because I think that there's kind of an openness that genre fiction allows for us. It distinguishes it from realistic books in some ways, um, where we know the rules going in. And so maybe we're more likely to be conservative. We teach the reader what is real, what is not real, what's possible, and what's impossible. And we teach, we ask them to let us teach them how to read our book. And so we should be interested in form, and we should be interested in language. And we're in one of those times when the way in which we can do this is rapidly changing. Our language is changing, and the way we think about what we write is changing, and how we write it, and how we're going to get it out to people. And so my non-Canadian optimism says what this does is this opens up a kind of tremendous possibility for us. And we should be excited. We should be genuinely excited about it. Because, you know, for this brief moment, we're the ones who get to make the rules for a little while. We're the ones who get to figure out what works. And so people are doing some really interesting things with books right now and what it means to write. So go out there and do the same. Yeah. <laughs>